How we get serious? All right. We, we were serious. Yeah. I'm always serious. <laughs> But we're even more serious now. Even more okay. serious. Okay. Yes. No, serious. This is really serious. Okay, you know, you guys are doing stuff down there. What is it? HCAT. 839 Cook Street. 531. Oh, You're 530 close. 531 Cook Street. <laughs> it's right next door to 839. And Cook it's Street. one block away from the, uh, this is it, uh, Bakery and Delicatessen. Yes. Yes, which is the reference point for the entire area. Yes. Yeah. So, um, what are you doing there? What are we doing there? Uh, actually, so HCAT is the Hawaii Center for Advanced Center Transportation, for Advanced Transportation Technologies. Technologies. Yes, you got it. And he runs it. I wrote it down here so I'd remember. <laughs> but um, what were we doing? Uh, last week we actually had our program review. We get most of our funding from the Air Force Research Labs. Uh, and we develop um, renewable energy and flight line energy solutions for the Air Force to use on their flight line and use in deployed operations to help them so they don't have to import as much fuel when they're downrange and they need to be uh, concerned about energy security. So that's basically what we do. Uh, primarily in our shop at Cook, on Cook Street, we um, convert uh, regular F-550 size buses and trucks into hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. And so the one really interesting thing about your shop there at 531 Cook Street, <coughs> Is that floor is clean? Yes, it is. And that is remarkable. You know, so few people can say that about industrial premises. I can tell you that one of our contractors down there, U.S. Hybrid, their boss is in California, and when he's scheduled to come out, those puppies are in there scrubbing and cleaning it because <laughs> he doesn't like to see any dirt and stuff. There's no oil. There's no oil. There's, There's no definitely gasoline. no oil. No smell of gasoline. Yeah, it's an it's an interesting shop for yes, motor it vehicles. Is. Yes, have you been is. there, Ray? I have not. It's, you can get a tour. I swear you can. <laughs> sure you can. We can even show some pictures, maybe. Oh yeah. Okay, let's show some pictures okay. of Stan's shop at 531 Cook Street. There you go. Oh, that, that's on. There's one there. This is a old, bottom right is a real old picture. That's when we were doing battery plug-in electric vehicles, and that that big white container there. Um, oops. Let me bring it back again. It's still in auto mode. Come on, there we go. Is uh, a refrigerated uh, container that we should check uh, the vehicles in cold temperatures. And then the big one on the left is a plug-in bus that shows you can actually plug in these fuel cell vehicles just like regular electric vehicles. And the uh, GM up on the right is, uh, looks like one of the early electric vehicles and we have some that are that size that are also fuel cell, uh, fuel cell electric vehicles. Uh, the slideshow that I brought with me today is actually um, got a whole bunch of different stuff that I took with the Chamber of Commerce to DC last week. Uh, we do a lot of work with the Air National Guard and this is one of the few Leeds Platinum buildings in the Air Force, if not the only one. And just like it says on the bottom there, um, those typically a building like that will be about $140,000 to $200,000 a month in electricity. And this building when it's uh, complete with its three different solar arrays will be net zero. It will be zero electric bill every month. And so that's one of the things we work. I work a lot with the congressional delegation. Um, Senator Harone has been very supportive. Um, and she's not up for election this year, so I can talk about her. Um, <laughs> she's been very supportive of a lot of the energy things that we do and uh, likes to get educated. That's actually a hydrogen station up at Schofield. It was the second one put into service on island. And um, that's Ed, my my cohort down at uh, HCAT standing in front of it. So you can see it looks a lot like a regular gas station. Um, not quite as fancy and, and that's Did the- Any smoke near the tanks? Nope. And uh, this is the original, um, the top picture is actually the original Hickam station that was built to be deployable. And the bottom <coughs> picture shows our 146 kilowatt um, photovoltaic array that can actually produce uh, about 12 to 15 kilograms of hydrogen a day without ever going on the grid for any electricity. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the, the station, a more modern picture of the station, a second generation at Hickam, and a vehicle in position to be uh, filled up with hydrogen. Um, portable storage, like I said, the Air Force needs to take its energy with it or uh, be able to transport it. That's a, a nine-cylinder nine energy storage that fits on an airplane in a standard pallet configuration that we can ship overseas. Uh, and the Army 
brought in a bunch of uh, GM fuel cell electric vehicles, and st those are still running today on island. They brought them in, I believe, in 2008 were the first ones that came in. And uh, they're being run right now, and they'll continue to run on island with the Navy and the Marine Corps for probably at least another year. Some folks ask what a fuel cell looks like. This is actually a really good picture. That's the fuel cell in the upper right-hand corner, and it almost has zero moving parts. You'll notice on the right are some cooling fans, and between the cooling fans and some pumps that circulate some uh, cooling liquids, there's not much that, that moves around in a fuel cell. And, I can, and uh, when we get to the end of the presentation, I'll, I'll show you why. And that's uh, an upside-down uh, picture of a vehicle that shows you how it's configured. In the center are some large, usually lithium-ion batteries, either a single one or, or two. And then a, a large, um, usually 30 kilowatt or bigger motor in the back. Uh, two hydrogen storage containers that hold about five kilograms each of hydrogen at 5,000 PSI. And in the very front, the little blue thing you see, that little tiny thing, that's a fuel cell. And it basically mm -hmm. uses the hydrogen to make electricity. Well, there's our shop. <coughs> Uh, a couple of the vehicles, including a full-size Mack dump truck that's uh, going through conversion. Look at that floor. That's yeah, really there's that floor you can eat off of, I'm yeah, telling you. Yeah. And so my, my so when, when you convert, the fuel cell converts the hydrogen into electricity, and then you just run a regular electric motor right. to operate the vehicle. The fuel cell will um, run the motor and also can charge the batteries. So one oh. point you made, which is really interesting, is how small it is. Mm -hmm. The fuel cell itself is really a fraction of the size of the, of, of the other equipment. Really, and a lot of times what we consider when we're, re, well, when we're converting the vehicles is we put in enough batteries to get it back too close to its original gross weight because if we make it too light, they're, they're commercial vehicles. They start to not meet the standards that you need to for a highway mm -hmm. have enough weight on the chassis. So we actually consider that when we start putting batteries in there. Uh, to make sure we can can get the weight to the right the right uh, level. Uh, if we can go back to the slides, this is uh, another uh, company that we do business with. Um, it's called Natural Power Concepts out of out of Honolulu, and this is uh, on Lagoon Drive, their test bed. <coughs> that uh, that funky looking football with the screw screw blades on it is. Uh, actually an in-stream hydroelectric uh, generator mm. and I have a full-size actual working model picture coming up. Behind it that um, thing that looks like a tin can standing up on, on its end is a vertical wind turbine that could be used on the side of a high-rise buildings to generate electricity and then the small um, looks like uh, the top of uh, a little monopool on the right is um, a uh, it's like a top of a sprung structure or a building that has a curved roof like the Blaisdell Center. Uh, it's a turbine, wind turbine that fits across the ridge of the roof and generates electricity. Can you hold for a second, sure. Stan? It's time for a break. We'll take a short break and in the middle of that discussion, everybody will want to come back and see. Okay. Because it's interesting. Stan Osterman, HCAT, uh, and uh, Ray Starling, Hawaii Energy and co-host. This is Think Tech Hawaii, uh, Wednesday, Hawaii, the state of clean energy and we're talking about what is going on at HCAP. We'll be right back after this break. Aloha, this is Kelee Akina. It's my privilege to be the host of Ehana Kako, a weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Ehana Kako, what does that mean? Well, many people have heard of a pule kako, let's pray together. Ehana Kako means let's work together. Let's work together to build a better economy, government, and society. And every week, Monday from 2 to 3 o'clock, you will see movers and shakers and other people who are working together to build a better economy government and society. Again, I'm Kelii Akina on the Ehana Kako weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Aloha. See you here Mondays 2 to 3. Back. We're live. We're here with Stan Osserman of HCAT, Ray Starling of Hawaii Energy. We're talking about what's going on at HCAT on 530, 531 Cook Street right here at Kakaako. You're all over it, man. I'm telling you. Okay. Well, if we look back at the slides that we left off with, um, these are some pretty innovative designs. That football looking one on the left, um, when John Petrie, the, the head of the company that does this stuff, uh, pushed that out, there was about maybe five or six knots of wind blowing. Now remember, that's, that's a design that's meant to be hydroelectric, in other words, in a stream of water to move it. Well, that five knots of wind started blowing that thing, and it started turning and turning and turning and turning. 
And after about 10 minutes while we were looking at some other things, he said, Stan, go up and grab the shaft of that and stop that thing. And he was being facetious, but I actually tried. I would have gotten my skin ripped off my hands if I really tried to do it. just from five knots away. Yeah, and it was really spinning like crazy, like going to Joe oh. Montana's football you know, spirals or something. Mm -hmm. Incredibly, a lot of torque in there, and, and it does generate a lot of electricity, so even does, in wind. Does that suggest that this type of design could be used for wind? I mean, yes. In lieu, in lieu of an ordinary wind turbine? Certainly. Huh? And so um, this is another one of John's designs. The upper left-hand corner shows, we call it the folding flower. It shows it completely um, stowed, and the bottom right shows it starting to open. Um, but you actually, believe it or not, it faces into the wind as it is in the upper left-hand corner with the wind coming from the left. And all you have to do is just start the blades turning and they actually open up and the wind starts blowing and it starts generating electricity. These, uh, these uh, blades are about five to six feet long, mm -hmm. but the uh, actual one that's gonna be built is a 50 foot diameter. So we call it medium wind, which is an area that are not a whole lot of folks are doing work in. There's a lot of folks doing, you know, like on your yachts, little tiny generators that go on the back of your boat, and then the big huge things that Hawaiian Electric and the big wind farms do. But in the medium sized range, there's not a lot of work being done. This particular design uh, is um, eventually going to turn into a piece of equipment that can fold and stow into a 40 foot container and be shipped with the military and put in the field it will open up, have photovoltaics on the, the roof and sides that go and uh, collect sun. It'll have a diesel generator for a backup, and then it can generate wind. In about 35 knots of wind, if you go much past that, it's hitting the limits of this, um, this design. The fingers will fold down, and the whole thing will retract into the 40-foot container. All without additional power. Um, it's, it takes it's a, driven by the, 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 the force of the wind to do that. No, it'll to to, re de to deploy and, and retract it will use some of its own power okay. that it makes. Okay. Hydraulic power primarily. Very um, interesting. But great and design. John Petrie was an artist. He is. He is an artist. He's an artist and a uh, <laughs> helicopter pilot and um, mm -hmm. all kinds of cool stuff. Yeah. And a surfer, everything. And Creative he's over guy. 70, 70 years, 70 plus years old and he's still out there surfing. So. <laughs> Okay, um, that's uh, me and my former life. Uh, Looks like General Schwarzkopf. <laughs> well, that's, that's General Stan before he retired from the Air National Guard, standing in, in front of one of our favorite projects, the fuel cell uh, plug-in electric bus from US Hybrid. Uh, it's an awesome vehicle. Um, we've decided after our program review last week that we're going to do one modification to this bus. We're going to take all those windows out and put in better windows. When you're driving in this bus, the only thing that makes noise is the windows rattling, <laughs> period. And it's a total distraction, so much so that Air Force said, we're going to change those things because it's a shame to have a vehicle that's so quiet and powerful and, can, and is just so cool and have the windows rattling to a distraction. If you had a conventional engine, you wouldn't hear the windows because everything else would be so Exactly. <laughs> and we took this bus from Hickam all the way up to Schofield to put some hydrogen in it while the team was here. And, and on the freeway, the windows were rattling so bad that uh, mm -hmm. it was a total distraction. But it's an awesome vehicle, and we've taken the city and county bus folks and um, some of the other state and private uh, tour companies out in this bus to, so they can experience the technology. And the private uh, bus companies really like this. The tour bus companies love this technology because they don't have to shut down their air conditioning when they stop in the hotels. They can leave the air conditioning running full blast and there's no noise and no uh, smoke and no diesel fumes and no carbon monoxide. And uh, the, the hotels and the, and the travel folks love it. So we think this technology is going to have a civilian application sometime real soon. Mm -hmm. So I promised you the in-stream uh, water uh, auger, hydroelectric. This is it. And it's in Kaneohe, on Kaneohe Bay. Um, they've had it in the water in Kaneohe Bay. And it's hard to get a, an idea of how big this is. But look at these tires. These are regular truck type tires on the trailer to give you an idea of how big this unit is. But you put this thing into uh, a stream of water and they had it running up in the Pacific Northwest for almost a year. And it's got two 75 kilowatt generators up there and in about three to six knots of stream flow, it can generate a total, not combined, but I mean, not a 
individually, but a total of about 75 kilowatts between the two generators. Wow. So uh, if you, I think if you really got, got it moving in 12 <laughs> to 15 knots of water, you probably could max out the generators. But again, this was a prototype that was actually used, and it's, it's very impressive. All stainless steel and aluminum, and where the stainless and aluminum actually touch, there's, uh, there's bushings, uh, um, plastic bushings between them, because there is a galvanic reaction between stainless and aluminum. So, so that's also a, a natural power concept? This is natural power concepts mm -hmm. also. Uh, they also have another, another thing that we haven't gotten involved with them yet, but it's a wave motion uh, electric generator or desalinization. Uh, piece of equipment. Uh, that's another picture of our bus at our at our shop. Very pretty bus. You take uh, it out every day. Uh, it's out at Hickam. It's being used every day. It's a regular scheduled bus. Right around Hickam. Right. Um, now, how, how far? How much mileage can you get before you have to come in and fill her up again? We're uh, we're still trying to get. It kind of depends on the hills and the driving technique of the driver, but. Mm -hmm. Um, as a general rule of thumb, we're counting on 100 miles on that bus before you have to put anything else in it. Um, in reality, we're getting close to 120 miles before we, we recharge mm -hmm. it. Okay. So it's a pretty pretty good piece of equipment. Um, we're also, uh, I work a lot with um, <coughs> the private sector and um, other, not just the Air Force, but a lot of folks that do, deal with energy. And one of our field trips, we went up to visit Richard Ha, a farmer on the mm -hmm. Big Island. And he's doing some pretty innovative stuff because he's got a lot of irrigation and he's also on 600 acres of uh, the side of a hill, which gives you good opportunity to do hydroelectric. So um, using the existing flumes that were there from the sugar days in Hamakua, he's got a generator plant that's running and he was just waiting for the interconnect with Elko and he just got that, I think, last month. And he's now generating electricity for his entire farm on the Big Island. Wow. Why does he need why does he need help going from that? Um, he just do it. Well, I think if you asked him, he'd want to just do it himself. But uh, I think he actually generates more electricity than he could use. Oh, so it's a net energy meter right. issue. Right, right. Okay. This uh, next slide is on the Big Island also. This is um, uh, Mr. Hank Rogers and the Blue Planet Research folks, mm -hmm. uh, their facility. I'd, I'd like to claim that HCAT would be the first place on the, in the state to have their own hydrogen dispenser outside of a military base. But unfortunately, Hank Rogers has already stolen that honor from us. He has a nice little unit here made by a company called Millennium Rain. He stores his hydrogen at low pressure in a, in a regular propane tank, and he's got about four more sitting out in the field behind these uh, banana trees. And he, he's <coughs> waiting for the first hydrogen fuel cell vehicles to get to the Big Island so he can fill them up right so at his station. Yes, the, the, the fueling station, but no, no right. vehicles. <laughs> and then this is his electrolyzer uh, right here. This, um, the the uh, three blue looking uh, things are, are actually the electrolyzer that he's using. And it's a state of the art, one of the newer companies out there that's um, making uh, hydrogen cheaper and cheaper. It, uh, it basically takes water splits it into hydrogen and oxygen, and it runs through these two, these two cylinders on the side or desiccants that take all the moisture out of the hydrogen if there's any left, and then they store it and use it in the fuel cell. So he makes it right there. Right. Right, right in that picture he makes it. What I don't have a picture of is his building that all this stuff is next to or in has a big south-facing roof. It's a, it's a single-sided roof. And it's all photovoltaic. I think it's 85 can kilowatts. Can you do that gesture again so we can? Uh, I'd like to when we get it on film. Okay, yeah. right. That, the Come dimensional on, thing. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. It's right. almost like surfing. Yeah. <laughs> so 85 <laughs> kilowatts on his roof that makes all the electricity to run this. Okay. Now this ranch at Puvava is going is already off the grid. The only That's thing. It's above Kona. It's just above Kona, mm -hmm. a little bit towards Waimea, mm -hmm. and the only thing that they use. Um, Helco Power for is there's a well on their property that they service a whole bunch of people in the area that still uses grid power but everything else on the ranch runs off of um, photovoltaics and when there's spare electricity they use this electrolyzer to turn it into hydrogen and they store it and when they need electricity back they have a stationary fuel cell which is actually in this cabinet right next to it and it makes electricity back for them at night and when they don't have uh, sunshine. So that's already happening. Already happening on the big island. But it doesn't sound efficient, you know. Is it efficient? 
Uh, it's very efficient. I mean, he'll tell you he loves it. In fact, uh, Mr. Rogers uh, has his own, uh, his house over here on Oahu completely off the grid, which I don't, I, I think he'd be proud to say that. I'm not sure that the, the county and, Hill, and Hiko would want to know that, but he, he lives in town and his house is off the grid, uh, running off of PV and stationary fuel cells and, and battery systems, lithium ion phosphate batteries. Hmm. That's exceptional. Of course, he has a little bit more money than you or I do, and he can afford it, but the technology is getting cheaper and cheaper and, and better. Someday we'll all be able to do it. I'm hoping. I'm hoping. What, what is the PSI for those propane tanks at versus... Their these, limits? What is the... Well, yeah. I think he's storing in these things at a... I want to say around between two and 300 PSI, really low pressure. Okay. And, and that's why he has several big tanks out there. Um, and, we and normally store at Hickam, we've been storing at around 3,200 PSI, and some of the other stations like Schofield and Kaneohe, they're storing at like 6,200 or 6,300 PSI. The passenger vehicles run, uh, have 10,000 PSI storage on the vehicle, and our big trucks and buses have 5,000 PSI on the vehicle. So what we like to do is that the stations have higher than 5,000 so that when we fill, yeah. we can give them a full tank because we never drop below the 5,000. And so we just cascade flow it right into them. I'm going to take a short break. With Stan Osterman, HCAT, and Ray Starling, Hawaii Energy, and my co-host. Here we are at Think Tech uh, Talks uh, on Wednesday. Of course, that's uh, the day for Hawaii, the state of clean energy. We're talking about what happens at HCAT. A lot happens at HCAT. Now, after this break, we're going to talk about what that all means. Okay, we're going to get some interpretive uh, you know, thinking going on this. Be right back. I'm Hong Jiang, host right. for Asia In Review on Tuesdays. So, and seconds. I'm David Day, host for oh, Asia David. Review on well, Thursdays. You know? Both of us broadcast um, our respective shows on the, at on the, the uh, And my topics the, tend to deal the, with uh, net one. questions related you to the open it up because some of the printing on the slides of the computer is not showing. Rights. And on, my on shows corners, tend to be on international business, foreign policy, geopolitics, and national security. And you can watch our shows live on yeah, the more. Think Tech website at thinktechhawaii.com. Okay. And uh, you can also That's watch good. us on YouTube or Alalo. So come join us on Thursdays at 4 p.m. I'm David Day. Yeah. Well, I and this is impromptu. So I'm Hong Aloha. Okay, we're Aloha. back. We're live. We're here at Think Tech Talks talking about Hawaii, the state of clean energy, exploring hydrogen with Stan Osterman of HCAT and Ray Starling of Hawaii Energy. And we've been talking about what happens at HCAT. We've got a couple more slides before we get into the philosophical questions. <laughs> OK. Well, you were asking about what, um, what things we're making. Aside from that really cool bus, uh, this piece of equipment that my partner Ed is standing on is called an R12 refueler. What it does, and you probably see these at Honolulu Airport, is a lot of the airports and military bases have what's called a hydrant system. So they store their fuel off in a remote part of the base, and then they, they send the fuel in underground pipes out to the flight line and hook up an R12 to pump it into the airplane. Well, this is a refueling uh, system, the R12, that's completely run off hydrogen. This upper left-hand picture is a, a picture of the fuel cell, so you can see how small it is. It actually looks like probably the top half of the engine. And what's underneath is, is uh, probably more battery storage and stuff, because really, the fuel cell does not take up a whole lot of space in the engine. So you have the battery, I'm sorry, you have the, uh, what, the fuel cell uh -huh. is driving the engine with electrical energy. Driving a motor, a electric motor. motor. Uh, using electrical energy. Right. And, um, and, and the car has lots of fuel for the fuel cell, so. Right. You, and, and then it's storing energy in the battery also. Right. So. so you know, I mean, there's, there's a whole model going on developing, and uh, it sounds like you've made progress in the past few years. This was this is way beyond the way it was. Uh, I don't know when I, I was on uh, the board at uh, the High Tech Development Corporation, which supervises HCAT. Right. HCAT is a part of High Tech, and Tom Quinn was there, right. and that's why I know the floors are so clean. Okay, <laughs> and um, you know, it was a small operation, or much smaller at at Hickam anyway in those days. Now it looks like it's really going somewhere. The Air Force has put some money into it and it is, you know, uses that go way beyond the way it was. But, you know, where is it going? Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about this, uh, this truck a little. 
you know, you think about the, just the concept of a fuel cell driving your drivetrain and moving you around. Well, what we found with this vehicle, or what we had to, to resolve and design into this vehicle is, this vehicle comes into contact with aircraft. And anything that touches an airplane has to go through a fairly rigorous process of uh, evaluation to make sure that it's safe and that um, it can, you know, have static discharge problems or fire issues. Mm -hmm. So this whole piece of equipment and getting it on the, on the road, uh, U.S. Hybrid and the Air Force did a lot of work uh, to make sure this was compatible with, with what goes on in the Air Force on a flight mm -hmm. line. So this was a fairly big project, and it's out at Hickam in operation now. Okay. Uh, that's a relatively new development, yeah, right. in, the, in the pipeline. And you were talking about our clean floors. This is uh, some folks from U.S. Hybrid. This is Todd, Chris, and Glenn. And they're doing a pressure tech with some nitrogen on one of the um, panels that's going to go into a vehicle. And so you can see that um, we have some pretty high-tech and highly trained folks here. And we're talking to U.S. Hybrid about, you know, helping us develop and work with some folks in California to develop college curriculum for HCC and some of our community colleges to get other folks trained to come into these jobs. Because uh, this company, U.S. Hybrid, is actually looking to expand operations uh, in Hawaii and create jobs for Hawaii people. So that fits right into our DVED model. That's what we're trying to do. Okay, the, this next uh, couple slides, you asked about where are we going and, and what's, uh, what's the holdup. Um, I didn't say that, but I okay. will. I'll okay. say so, Stan, what's the whole thing? <laughs> I'm glad you asked, Jay. I have a slide here that talks to it. Well, really, this, this one statement down here, cost reduction, has been the biggest holdup with hydrogen. Um, it's always been very expensive to make uh, hydrogen and to include it in, uh, in your systems. The reliability and safety piece, we have an image problem with the Hindenburg and everything. Everybody thinks hydrogen and <laughs> explosions and things blowing up and big fires. But actually, hydrogen, when we briefed the, uh, the first responders and the federal fire folks, uh, after they got the training, they went, wow, we'd, we'd rather deal with hydrogen than with gasoline. It's, it's actually a much safer um, element to deal with. But as you can tell, what we're trying to do here is Hawaii's missing this piece, and that is the, the, develop, or the um, manufacture of hydrogen on site. And it's one of the advantages of hydrogen. You don't need to drill for it. You don't need to frack for it. You don't need to ship it in big tanker ships. You don't need to put it in a refinery. Your electrolyzer literally just takes water and electricity to make hydrogen and oxygen. It basically takes a water molecule and splits it into hydrogen and oxygen. The oxygen can be used in the medical field, in welding, whatever you'd like, and then you store the hydrogen in cylinders when so you want to use it. This is big. This is a big thing. I mean, we talk all day long about um, you know um, uh, interconnection and the need for storage. Right. And I mean, it's like a barrier between us and the next chapter of renewable energy is storage. And you're talking about storage. Exactly. You're talking about I should have an electrolyzer, a take electricity made in the in the hot sun with the solar in the middle of the day and I make hydrogen out of that, and then I take it out at night when I need it. Right. So why isn't this happening? Um, like I said, a lot of it had to do with cost. It's getting a good the, question, getting the, the Good question, good, Jay. It's funny you should ask. You know? I'm glad you asked me that question. <laughs> um, it is getting cheaper. Um, that, that picture I showed you on the Big Island of the electrolyzer that Hank Rogers has, the company that's manufacturing that has, has dropped the price uh, I would say substantially. You can, you can buy one of his units for under $100,000 that makes hydrogen, stores hydrogen, and dispenses hydrogen. In, in other words, you can have your own little miniature hydrogen gas station for less than $100,000. You still need electricity. And okay. water. So, Ray, did you have a question about the 100000 Is that with gross excise? No, I was going to get, I was going to get there eventually, but, but I was wondering, you know, you, you mentioned the Hindenburg. Uh, and I know that uh, hydrogen is, um, you, you can't smell it, you can't see it, right. you can't taste it. Totally. How do you deal with the possibility that you will have a leak? How do you know? I mean, okay. you, you strike a match no, and That's see? a good question. <laughs> um, first of all, you're going to have a really slow leak that's, that's just tiny, tiny, you mm -hmm. know, little, little, you know, atoms at a time coming out. Uh, in which case, unless it's going to collect inside of an enclosed space, mm -hmm. um, 
it's just going to dissipate in the air before you, you'd ever get to a flammable level. If you have a fairly large leak, and we're talking five and 10,000 PSI storage, if you have a puncture in a tank, you're going to you, know you have yeah, a leak. Yeah. It's going to be making a jetting noise, and you'll see a vapor as the, as the gases cool coming out, and they start to form clouds. So it becomes visible. It's visible, okay. and you'll hear it. Um, in fact, some of the, even the smaller leaks at the, at the fueling station, they'll actually go, hey, we think we hear something, they'll stop and they'll get a leak detection uh, meter out and look for uh, and try and sense any flammable gases or hydrogen. But the bottom line is, at our, like at our stations, they have infrared cameras that sense heat because the flame is invisible. So mm. the cameras look for infrared changes and then what would happen is if the cameras sense any heat above a threshold in the area, they will literally shut off the, uh, all the dispensing equipment and they purge the area with nitrogen to put out any kind mm -hmm. of fire because without oxygen in the area, you mm -hmm. won't have a fire. Okay. Just like inside the tank, when you have pure hydrogen in the tank, it can't burn. It's right. not flammable right. unless you have oxygen present yeah. in certain proportions. So storing the, the hydrogen in tanks is safe. Uh, but for example, if you were gonna have hydrogen at your house, you wouldn't want to have it in your enclosed garage. Mm -hmm. I would put my tank out behind the carport or out behind the garage so if there's a leak, it goes in the air. And what you'll notice is, how come my tank's not as full as it should be when two months ago, with the same sun and everything, it was filling it all up with my mm -hmm. little electrolyzer. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it, it's a little bit different. If you take something flammable and stick it into a hydrogen flame, it'll show color because now you have carbons in there that start to, you know, any, any components that are in there now will show their colors as they burn. But the hydrogen flame is virtually invisible. At night, it has a slight blue color to it. But there's some other interesting principles Before of hydrogen. That, I went out to the fire department, uh, Honolulu Fire Department training facility, which is out near the airport, to see uh, a demonstration of exactly what you're talking about. And they have equipment, the firemen have equipment where they can see the flame, even though the flame is invisible, right? It's, it's infrared, right. that's what it is. And well, it's a handheld little, detector. Yeah, that right, you hold it in your hand, and uh -huh. like a little video thing, and you can see the flame. Right. Um, what, what's tricky about it, though, is that if you don't see the flame, um, you know, you can get burned, right? Because it's hot, and, yes. you know, and it's leaking and burning at the same time, and you put your hand in there accidentally, you're going to get burned bad. In interesting thing, and I don't know if you saw this in the demonstration as well, but when hydrogen burns, it, it basically goes in almost straight up in a cylinder. So you can take your hand and put it right next to the flame. Yes. And, and it doesn't radiate heat the way regular carbon-based oh, really? fuels do. You can't so you can, tell. you can take your hand and put it next to the flame and not feel it. And then as soon as you go over the flame, you have max heat and it'll fry you in a heartbeat. Yeah. So yeah, you have to be really careful. Other interesting thing, and we saw this at Hank Rogers Ranch on the Big Island, because uh, uh, Paul Pontolo, is his chief engineer, has a little um, gas stove uh, made of, to run hydrogen. And if you take like a cold pan and stick it over the flame, you'll see condensation on the outside of the pan because the flame actually has moisture in it. It's a moist heat, if that makes mm -hmm. any sense, as opposed to the dry heat in Vegas, mm -hmm. where everybody doesn't mind going there because it's a dry heat. Well, the hydrogen's combining with the it's making water. to make water. Exactly. It's so interesting. But it's not cool. It's not <coughs> cool to the touch. No, it's not cool. It's hot. <laughs> it's hot water. I mean, but it is, there is moisture there that develops. So before we run out of time, which we're going to do soon, which, you know, I mean, I'm really delighted you're here and we can have this conversation. We haven't had this, you know, in-depth drill down on hydrogen before, so it's great to have you here. Um, just, you know, where is it going? I mean, I, you know, the, the Air Force is always experimenting, putting the stuff together. You guys, too, you work with them. More buses and all this, but I, I still don't know if there's a single hydrogen car on the street. Um, and I personally, I don't know how you feel about this, Ray. We had a, you know, gang up and about this. I personally think hydrogen is great solution, fabulous solution, better even than electric vehicles even. Okay. Might uh, be. Might be, so, but we're not moving there. I want it, I want it to move faster, and so I want to know where is it on the continuum? Okay. How long do I have to wait for my wife's hydrogen car? And, and, and um, you know, uh, uh, how are we going to introduce it, and what, 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 what problems still lie okay. ahead? Well, obviously, Jay, you're a victim of 
immediate gratification or yes, society I am. is. And my wife tells me that too. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there, it's getting there. And I mentioned the Big Island several times and the folks on the Big Island. And I, and I do that on purpose because really, if you go back to what's slowing us down, it comes down to money. Um, and the government, when they start to look at things and they have all their rules and things, it tends to get more and more expensive. <clears throat> the folks on the Big Island that work with um, um, Blue Planet and, and some of the other farmers, they're out there and they're going, they're saying the same thing as you. Where's my hydrogen? Where's my vehicles? How come we can't do this? The technology is starting to get cheap enough where investors are going, that makes sense. And as you mentioned, it's about storage, energy storage. You can store energy in batteries. <laughs> You can store energy in flywheels. You can store energy in gasoline. You can store energy in hydrogen. So why, why is hydrogen not more in that mix? And it's because it's been expensive to make the hydrogen and storing it is actually pretty cheap because those storage tanks last 20, 30 years. I mean, they last forever. They're, they're carbon fiber and all high tech. Um, a battery doesn't last for 20 or 30 years. So if you think about, like you say, battery vehicles may not be the answer. There's certainly, there's a place for batteries in these vehicles and, and vehicles that run on battery alone in cities and places where you have short runs. But if you're going to do something where you're going longer distances, like on the Big Island or on the mainland, <coughs> or here if you're used to fueling up and going 300 miles, you need something that stores enough energy on your, in your vehicle that you can do that. And hydrogen gives you that same feel in your car that gasoline gives you now. And, and it's an accidental benefit that it could be storage for, on a, you know, a homeowner's basis or even on an industrial scale. Um, well, I'm I hoping that Hawaiian Electric will look at hydrogen as um, distributed generation on their grid yeah. and put it out there. When they, when they have hydrogen av or electricity available from uh, PV out in their grid, they make some hydrogen and, and put it out there with a fuel cell in the grid. And then at night or when, they need the, when the demand goes up and the production's not down from the PV, the fuel cells kick in and put yeah. the energy back on the grid. Now the hydro hy hydrolyzer, did you call it? Electrolyzer. Electrolyzer uh, for $100,000. That's going to be for a house, right? That's going to be a residence. It's, it's relatively residence. small. Yeah. It's I mean, two uh, kilograms a day, which is enough to run a household. <clears throat> yeah. I just, I just wonder, uh, we're talking about real money. We're talking about industrial scale. Uh, there's, there's some companies that do industrial scale. Uh, and big, I mean, they, there's some big hydrogen production going on including using natural gas and other things to, um, to uh, reform hydrogen instead of making it an electrolyzer. Uh, but the, the point I made to the legislature this year and I just made to Ray earlier was, we want to focus on clean energy and clean uh, sources. We want to make our hydrogen, it's a more expensive way, but the clean way, electricity and an electrolyzer. Because you can take other carbon-based fuels and suck the hydrogen out of it. It's cheaper, it's faster, but we still have to import liquid natural gas to Hawaii. Other and we costs. still, yeah, yeah, I mean, so why would we want to do that here when we have plenty of, like you say, plenty of sunlight? We have geothermal, we have ocean thermal, we have um, uh, photovoltaic, we have wind, we have ocean waves. I mean, there's so many ways we can generate power to, to make so electricity. So HCAT is actually involved in this kind of thing. I mean, you could be a hydrogen maven, you know, going forward for storage. You could do that. Well, I mean, it's not it's not outside of your mission. Right? Well, one of the things that you asked me was, when are the cars going to get here? Yeah. The cars won't be here till the hydrogen's here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have to be involved in making hydrogen, or the cars will never be here. Yeah. And that's what I think the folks in the Big Island have realized, that until they start getting into <coughs> hydrogen production, <coughs> Hank Rogers won't have a Toyota to bring up to his little station on his ranch, because we need to have the hydrogen production. So my, my goal this year with the legislature is to start getting them to, they were, they were kind enough to extend the barrel tax uh, into 2030. I, I want to try and get them to maybe pull some of that, that money that's made for exploring renewable energy and transportation and putting into some infrastructure on Oahu and the other islands so that the vehicles will come here. I have a suggestion. For okay. You. What we need is a world standard for a hydrogen container. The kind that will stack, the kind that will ship anywhere, <coughs> okay. the kind that will last forever. Nobody's got that yet. Uh, I would look at California. There, yeah. I believe it's there. D Department of Transportation has already certified trailers and things that go on interstate highways. Uh, I think they're real close, if not already there on, on the Okay. Anyways, it's, it's, our time is up. I'm really sorry because this has been really helpful. 
and uh, open open mind kind of discussion. Ray, are you ready to make a summary? Well, yeah, I, I, as we've said so often, uh, you've only started here, and we'd like to um, be sure to have you back soon to talk more about this because I, I really believe this is a, a major player going forward uh, in all the things we're trying to do with the clean energy. I agree. I agree. So, yeah, thank wow. you. Okay, and we'll do I, this again. I, I, I do note that uh, having uh, recently retired as a general in the, uh, in the Air Force, uh, he's taken some liberties. He's, uh, I see he's starting to grow a beard. And that, uh, having been a former military guy myself, when I got out, I realized, you know, I, hey, I've really never been able to grow a beard because you were always from ROTC all the way through. You, Maybe this would be an encouragement for you. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to have a contest. <laughs> You know, see, I like it. I like it. It's not something wrong with our <laughs> camera. This is a real deal. You know, we show he every looks hair. Good. He looks high good. Definition. He looks good. Yeah. <laughs> That's Stan Awesome, and the one with the beard uh, runs HCAT, and uh, Ray Starling runs Hawaii Energy. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. This is Think Tech Hawaii. We're talking about the Hawaii, the state of clean energy, and there's so much to know and learn and follow. Today, we've talked about what happens at HCAT, largely about hydrogen. Thank you so much, John. Thank you, Jay. All right. Aloha. Yeah, thanks, Jay. Until next time. Jay and Ray. I love Jay it. Jay and Ray, yeah. <laughs>